this opportunity to gather together as your church and to study your word, Lord. I ask that you would open our eyes and our ears to hear what you would have to, to teach us tonight, Lord, and be with Dawn as he brings the word, Lord. I ask this in your name. Amen. Well, good evening, everyone. Oh, come on. That was pretty bad. Good evening, everyone. Much better. Aren't we excited? Didn't we come to hear the word of God? So that's what we're going to hear. Uh, if you came here tonight without a Bible and you'd like to follow along, uh, raise your hand. We'll give you a Bible. If you don't have one, you can keep it. If you do have one, but you like this one better, you can keep it. So it's our gift to you. So just don't take one every week and then, you know, so... So we will be in Joshua chapter 2 this week. Uh, as we started the book of Joshua last week, uh, there was a, a thing that, that God kept telling Joshua. Do you remember what it was? Be strong, be strong and of good courage. Be of great courage. Be of strong courage. And he kept telling them over and over again. You know, Moses has passed away. He's gone. Joshua's got to take these two and a half million. And, you know, we don't know exactly how many. Somewhere between two and three. So we're just going to sit in the middle. And say two and a half million people wandering through the desert. Stopping at the Jordan. Ready to cross over. They did this before. Well, their fathers did. And it didn't work out well for them, did it? That's what the whole book of Deuteronomy, when we were in there, you know, just a few weeks ago, uh, was all about. Then they come to the, now they come to the land. Moses has passed away. Joshua's got to lead him. We talked about before how the law, Moses, couldn't lead them into the promised land. But only a man named Joshua, named Jesus, could lead them just like he leads us. And God kept encouraging, you know, be strong. Be strong and of good courage. Be strong and very courageous. And he said it over and over again. And then after he got done telling them, just to make sure that he got it, which we'll see. Uh, remember the ha uh, half the tribe of Manasseh, Reuben, and Gad, remember they said the same thing to him. It's okay, be strong and of good courage. And that's where we left off last week. And we come now, as they're still sitting in that same spot, getting ready to cross over, but now they have some action that they're gonna do tonight. And in chapter two, verse one, it starts out, now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. Now, it's kind of interesting because he's sending out two men, two spies, and he tells them to go out and take a look at the land. <coughs> and do you remember how many spies that Moses sent out? Twelve. Ten came back with a bad report. Oh, the land is great, but... There's giants. There's nothing we can do. We can't take this land. What are we going to do? Lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. But Joshua was one, was one of the 12, and so was Caleb. And they were like, wait a minute, wait a minute. This land's great. We could go in there, and with God on our side, we could do anything, anything. So Moses this time sends two. Now, it's kind of interesting because uh, in, according to Jewish tradition... One of the two men that uh, Joshua is sending out is Caleb. Interesting. You know he's going to come back with a good report, right? Although this is really not to spy out the land, if you really read into this, and we'll see this as we go, because, see, as we go through this, I think that, that God has put on Joshua's heart for these men to do this. And there's a purpose for this, and we're going to see what this purpose is. And the other one was the high priest, uh, Elixir. 
So there were two men that go. They left from Acacia Grove, which is right on the which is right on the edge of the Jordan River. Now remember, this is high tide. So instead of being, you know, maybe 30 feet wide normally or 40 feet wide, this is this is a quarter of a mile wide. And keep that in mind for when they go to cross over. So <clears throat> he goes to send these. Um, he sends these men over to them, and he does it, what, secretly. He didn't make a big deal out of it. You know, before, hey, everybody's going, now everybody's waiting. So it was just him sending these two men over, and there was probably Joshua and maybe a few other people that knew, sending them over secretly. And he says, go view the land, especially Jericho. Now, Jericho it was a very well-fortified city. We've already talked about that before. It was a very old city. It's probably one of the oldest cities uh, in the world. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged, near, lodged there. Now, that's kind of an interesting scenario. Hey, guys, I want you to go over here and spy out the land. And where do they end up? But, they, but see, but see, we're, you know, as we look at that and, and, and we see that, and if you really don't look at the scripture and you read them through, you might think, ah, what the heck? What are they going to a harlot's place for? Well, I could give you a good reason in the sense of, you know, all the travelers that would go through there and they were talking and telling about things and, and uh, you know, it was, it was like going to the, the beauty salon, you know? You, you sit there underneath that thing that goes on your head and you talk to your, or you get your hair cut and washed. And what do you do? You talk and you tell your whole life story. They know more about, you know, your marriage and the things you do, your family, than most anybody, even your best friends. So they go to this place. Now we're going to see that her house was on the top of the wall. Now what they had is See if I can get this right. They had about 50, they had a 15 foot thick wall, okay? And then there would be a space of about 10 feet. And then there would be another wall inside of that that would be like 20 to 25 feet. So what they would do is they would, they would uh, lay these beams across between the two, and then they would have that whole space for their house. They, between, they would lay it between the two walls and they would build themselves a house. So this is where she lived. Uh, she was a harlot in spite of some people who say she wasn't. I mean, we're going to see it over and over again. We're going to see it in the New Testament. She was a harlot. That's what she was. And it's interesting because last week we were in um, Matthew, or a couple weeks ago, we're still in Matthew, but uh, on Sundays when we're in Matthew, we saw this, this woman, didn't we? We saw her name, Rahab, as a descendant of who? Jesus. Now, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? You know, she turns out to be the mother of Boaz. Anybody know who Boaz is? He's found in the book of Ruth. He's also a descendant of David, King David. Or actually, he was great-great-grandparent of David. But he was in Christ's line. He was in Christ's genealogy, along with Rahab. Very interesting, isn't it? And uh, so that's where they went, and they lodged there. Now, turn with me. This woman was kind of unique. And we're going to see something about her as we continue in the chapter, but I want to point something out to you first, okay? Just in case you're wondering, you know, so I was looking around the internet, which usually isn't a good place to go, but anyway, I was looking around the internet about Rahab and such, and there, and there's a lot of atheist people that say that this is one part of the Bible here that, that proves that Jesus Christ was not God. Kind of interesting. How could God be a descendant of a harlot? Oh, and who was the one before Tamar? She pretended to be a harlot, right? 
So you had her, and, you had, and then you had Ruth. She was a Moabitess. They were cursed to the 10th generation, were they not? They couldn't enter this, the, uh, the holy place or the tabernacle to the 10th generation. Well, how is that? Well, we looked at that last week, or in, in, uh, we looked at that two weeks ago. But see, God's grace. You know, God purposely had these people in his lineage. Why? Why were they there? To prove that no matter what you were, how dark your life is, that he loves you. He's chomping at the bit to forgive you. He died for your sin. He gave up everything for you so that he could be with you throughout eternity. He gives all of us the one thing that we need in our lives, that we need to know, and that's that we're loved. And he does that for us. Then he, now our home is in heaven where we have what? Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. So you take these four women that are mentioned in Matthew in the lineage of Jesus. This woman that you were mentioning here, she was a harlot. There's no doubt about it. There's no way to sugarcoat it. But you know what? She's forgiven. Right? Turn with me to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, and uh, we're going to, verse 31. Now this is the, the passage on faith. This is the hall of faith, and it says right here in verse 31, by what? And how do we get to heaven? By faith. Oh, come on, are you guys asleep? It's by what? Thank you. And how do you get to heaven? There we go. Well, that wasn't as good as the other one, but hey, uh, by faith, the what? Harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. Why? Because she had faith. Turn with me to James chapter 2. So it's the next book. It might even be the next page. And I believe it's verse uh, 25. And it says this, likewise, now this is James, the brother of Jesus, uh, likewise was not Rahab the harlot, what was she? She was a harlot, right? <laughs> likewise also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. Through her faith, there was an action, a work and what did she do? She was justified when she, sent, when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. She's a believer. You're going to see her in heaven. And, you, you know, what was it like living on the wall? Uh, turn back to Joshua. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. <clears throat> and it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. Now this had to be pretty scary as we're going to see how they felt about Israel. And so it was told the king of Jericho that they were, they were men to come search out the country. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab saying, now do you know why the guys went to Rahab? Because everybody knew you needed gossip. You go there. And you know, it's just like being at the hairdressers, you know, you, you, you talk about whatever. And they probably knew they probably knew what was going on. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab saying, bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. She knew all the secrets. But, you know, I kind of am joking about that because we're going to see this 
These two men were sent to Jericho for a purpose, to go to the house of a harlot so that she could be saved, her and her family. Isn't that how God is? How grace abounds. Even know whatever it is you're into, whatever it is you've done, there's no ending of that grace. There's no end to his forgiveness. And even for a woman who maybe not in this day, but most of us here can remember when you never even talked about somebody that was a harlot. <gasps> remember? Those were the good old days. Now it's wide open, it's available, it's everywhere. But here, God sends these two men. They didn't need to scout out the land, did they? We're going to see when they come back at the end of the chapter. <laughs> Joshua never even asked them, what's their military strength and what's this and what's that? They just told what happened with Rahab. Because this is how God is. And you know what? He's done that with each and every one of us, hasn't it? He's found a way to tug at our heart to put somebody there, to put maybe multiple people there, to maybe something goes on, that he could get our attention so that he could say to us, I love you, my son. I love you, my daughter. I provided a way for you. I know you've been struggling. I know your God has been drugs or alcohol or pornography or whatever it may be. You know, soon to be gambling, because I don't know if you know, uh, anybody that watches football, and I really don't, but every commercial now for football includes gambling. How you can bet now just sitting where you're sitting. It, you, a couple of years ago, it wasn't like that, at least not that I knew of. I mean, you had to go somewhere, do it offline. It's just open and available. What's that going to do? It's just going to cause more families to go into poverty. I know. I used to deal cards back in the day in Vegas. And I know what goes on. The odds are stacked against you. They don't have to cheat because we're greedy and we'll keep going until we're wiped out. But it doesn't matter what we've done, who we are. God loves you. He created you. He gave up everything. Can you imagine if you were God? Why would you come down here? I mean, you know, I'm just a sinner. I sin every day. It's a struggle. It's a battle. It's a war. But he forgives me, and he loves me, and he blesses me. And it almost seems like no matter how bad it gets, God is always there. It, it doesn't seem that way. It is that way. Why? Why? Why me? I know a lot of you. Why you? Don't you say that when you look in the mirror? Lord, why did you bless me? How many times this week has he blessed you where you just sat there and went, Lord, I can't believe you love me so much. I can't believe it. I'm disobedient to you. I fall so short. I say the stupidest things, and I think even the stupider things. But he loves me. And he went to that cross for me. And he did it for you as well. And so God's plan is, here's this woman. And she's going to be in the lineage of the Messiah, of God himself. Verse 4, then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, yes, the men came to me, but I, did not, but I did not know where they were from. Is that true? It's a lie. Right? She lied. 
And it happened as the gate was being shut when it was dark that the men went out. Is that true? She lied again. Now, you might be sitting here saying, where did it say that? As we read on, you, you'll see it. You'll see it because she'll explain it more in depth, or you'll see it more in depth. So there's two lies. Where the men went, I do not know. Eh. Sounds like today's society, doesn't it? Pursue them quickly, for you may overtake them. Another lie. <laughs> They're on my roof. How are you going to pursue them and overtake them? Another lie. And it's interesting. Now, God hates lying. It is a sin. We talked about this last week. Even when you might think, even when you might think that it's better to just keep your mouth shut or to tell a little white lie so that somebody doesn't get hurt. Their feelings don't get hurt. It's still wrong. It's still a lie. It's still a sin. Jesus had to pay that penalty on the cross. Now, God is not condoning her lies. Because you know what? And this is the funny thing. And we do this too, don't we? Okay. Well, let's see. What do I do? If I tell them the truth, they're going to be hurt. What do I do? Well, you tell the truth because that's what God says. As far as the hurt goes, God will work it out. Do you think that these two men would have got founded even if she didn't lie? God would have provided a way, wouldn't he have? He always does. He always provides a way out. And isn't that way for all of us? You're faced, you're getting attacked, you're faced with decision, what am I going to do? Am I going to lie to my boss or am I going to tell him the truth and probably get fired? But God will provide a way out. And maybe it is, you get fired. Why? Because he's got a better job for you. Maybe with more benefits. Maybe, maybe, because we all know that we work for who? We work for him, right? The jobs that we have are just a way that God provides for our eating, housing, clothes, right? But we work for him. It's a never-ending job. When we're done working, you know what happens? We don't retire. We go home, right? We go to be with him in heaven. So God would provide a way out. And this is what he would have done. She didn't need to lie. But she did, and she was forgiven. And she was forgiven for being a harlot and all the things that she said and did. Verse 6, but she had brought them up to the roof, to the roof. Is it roof or roof? Depends on where you're from, I guess, right? I know I, don't, I can't listen to my wife because she's from Pennsylvania, so I'm from Ohio. So they, we, we always are always the opposite. So if she says roof, I'm going to say roof. But anyway, what is it? <laughs> We're split down the middle. Okay. This side is okay. <clears throat> you know, I don't like these words. You know, it's like the sorcerer and the saucerer, whatever. So. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. So now if you, even if you go to Israel today uh, and you go up on, uh, you know, they have the house and then you go up on the roof and you, they usually use that as entertainment. But back then they used to take this, these stalks of flax, which was basically strands of, and they would dry them out. They were strands and they were like linen. <coughs> um, so that's what, <clears throat> she hid them with the socks of flax. So she buried them underneath these, this linen, uh, which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men persuaded them, then the men persuaded them by the road to the Jordan, to the Fords. Now this is the first mention of a car in the Bible, Ford, okay? <laughs> Actually, uh, it means like a pass, 
or you know, you get out in the middle, uh, you get out in the mountains, and there's a pass that you could go through, and instead of climbing over, okay. But uh, it is the first mention of cars. So <clears throat> as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know, interesting, I know that the Lord has given who? You, the land. How does she know this? Just like they knew to go to the harlot's house, just like the king knew where to go to get information. But see, the things that God has done has been seen and has been heard. And he says, I know the Lord has given you the land that the terror of you have fallen on us and all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. Interesting. Now turn with me back one book to Deuteronomy chapter 2. And in verse 25... It says this, this day I will begin to put the pressure, put the, I'm sorry, put the dread and fear of you upon the nations under the whole heaven who shall hear the report of you and shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. Did the, was God faithful? Did the people hear this? Yes. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 11. And I believe it's verse 25. It is. And it says this, No man shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will put the dread of you and the fear of you upon all the land where you tread, just as he has said to you. Turn back to Joshua. Here it is. We know that the Lord has given you the land. And it's interesting here because the word that she uses is Jehovah. God. The Lord Jehovah has given you the land that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. Is God faithful? He told him he was going to do it. Now, if you're one of those two spies, and you come in there, and you meet this girl named Rahab, and all of a sudden, hey, where are these men? And she hides them, and they're hiding up on the roof underneath the linen, the flax, and they're hiding underneath there. What are you thinking? Oh, no. They're going to capture us. They're going to torture us. They're going to put us in a dungeon. They're going to kill us. They're going to hang us or beat us. They probably would have beat them to get information out of them. What are they thinking? But see, now you come to hear after she had hidden them. And she says, I know the Lord has given you the land. It's a done deal. We're just sitting here waiting for you to come take it. That the terror of you has fallen on us. All those things. The parting of the Red Sea. All those nations. What happened in Egypt? They were the world power. They were the Rome in Jesus' time. Not so much square footage, but in that area, they were in charge. They had the might and the power. And God dealt with them over a nine-month period of time giving them nine months to repent, maybe 10. And what happened? They just kept being disobedient. Some got saved and ended up going with Israel. But the nation fell, didn't they? And like nothing, it was nothing for God to do that. And the whole time all these things are happening, Israel's sitting over there in Goshen going, hey, look at that cloud over there. Oh, wow, it's all awful dark over there. We're sitting here in the sunshine, so. Hey, 
Give me another lemonade. Frogs? Let's go grab some of them frogs. We can have frog legs for dinner. <clears throat> so it made them faint-hearted. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. Now remember, these two guys were some pretty powerful kings at the time. They were both giants. They were brothers. And they made short work of them really quick. And the people were fearful of these two guys, Sihon and Og. But they were utterly destroyed. Verse 11, and as soon as we, what, heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. This sounds like the words of someone who believes. Would you agree? Yeah. Now, it's interesting. She says here, she said, for we have heard in verse 10. In verse 11, she said, for we have heard. Now, if you turn with me to Romans chapter 10, we all know this passage, but I'm gonna, we're going to read it again. And I want you to turn there because I want you to know where it's at. Oh, it's on the right side of my page in Romans. And uh, yeah, it's around chapter 10. Let me look for this. Verse 17 of chapter 10 of the book of Romans says this. But then what? Faith, Faith comes by what? Hearing. hearing. And hearing, right, by the word of God. Do you want to strengthen your faith? You sit here today thinking, Lord, you know, I know you can do all this stuff, but I lack such faith. There you go. He answered your question. He's pretty quick, isn't he? All in the same hour. By faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, where would she have gotten the word of God? Well, look around. Look at the heavens. Look at the mountains. Look at the things that God has made. Look at the stories that people have probably came and said, there's this God in Israel like no other God that does things so that the world may know there is a God in Israel. Isn't that what David said about Goliath? So that all would know that there's a God in Israel. Look at what he did, the plagues. Very interesting. They had to hear these things. The world, the world today has heard about this God, haven't they? They've heard about Jesus Christ. But see, the problem is they hear it, but they don't do anything with it. Ah, that's not true. How can that be? The evidence is right here. It's all right here. What's the problem? It takes more faith to disbelieve. So she says that <clears throat> as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now therefore, I beg you, Swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a true 
token, uh, a pledge. Give me a pledge, a pledge of truth, um, a covenant. Let's make an agreement. I've shown kindness to you. You show kindness to me. And spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. Now, it's kind of interesting because when, when you first got saved and you realized who Jesus Christ was, what was probably one of the, mo the first things you did? I want to save my mom and my dad and my brothers and my sisters and my, you know, my aunts and my uncles and my friends and everybody I know at school and everybody... Uh, that don't like me at school and everybody that I work with except that one guy but we'll work on him later you know and my boss don't you know not yet for him you know but hey well maybe if he gets saved then you know things will change but it's kind of interesting that she, she says this and spare my father my mother my brothers my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death so the men answered her our lives for yours if none of you tell this business of ours, and it shall be when the Lord has given us this land, that we will deal kindly and truly with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall. She dwelt on the wall. Nice place to live, on the wall. But it's just like a sky rise here, you know, t tall building that you live in. And she said to them, get to the mountain. Okay, so you had the Jordan, you had Jericho, you had the mountains. The mountains were on the other side. She's sending them back the other way. She's sending them to the mountains. She's sending them further away from uh, the Jordan River and Joshua. But there's a reason for this. She says, and, and she said to them, get to the mountain lest the pursuers meet you. Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Afterward, you may go your way. So they're actually behind them. They're going down towards the Jordan looking for them, which they're not going to find them because they went the other way. God wouldn't let them find anyway. So it's kind of interesting also three days, three days of perfection. Uh, you know, there's, uh, when, you, when you look up num numbers and you study uh, the numbers in the Bible, and, and pretty much every time it's a, it is a uh, time of perfection. Jesus was in the grave three days. Um, and it, just like number two, it's kind of interesting. Uh, number two, sending two spies instead of 12. Most of the time, uh, the number two would represent the church. Joshua sending the church out to this harlot on the wall. Why? So that she can be saved. Sounds like our job, but we won't go there right now. So anyway, although I don't recommend you go to, you know, so anyway, but. <clears throat> so the men said to her, we will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's house to your own home. So they're saying, look, we'll keep this covenant with you, but you know what? If they don't show up or if you guys say something, then you're just as guilty as everybody else. Um, Kind of interesting that they use this cord, this, this scarlet or red cord, a blood red cord. Kind of sounds like when on the, on the Passover, what did they do? They put blood on what? The posts and the lentil, right? As, and what happened? At night, when the angel of death come through, what happened? Nothing. They saw the blood. They were alive, left alive, right? Now, here we're seeing this rope that has a, a scarlet thread or a scarlet cord wrapped in it. And when they see that, they're not to touch anybody in that home. 
It would be kind of an interesting picture to see because as the walls fell down in Jericho, obviously her house was standing there, right? I wish they would have taken a couple of pictures, you know, but anyway. You know, in a way, uh, Joshua would be this savior for Rahab. Because when he gets there, he's not going to, she's not going to be killed because of that cord, that scarlet cord. But he'll be judged to Jericho and they'll all be destroyed, won't they? Kind of like Jesus, right? He's our savior. But to the rest of the world who rejects him, he's their judge. Verse 19, so it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we will be guiltless, and whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. Just like the Passover. Just like the Passover in, in Exodus chapter 12. You know, they had the blood on the door. Let them go. They came out, and they weren't behind, under that covering of the blood. So be it. And if you tell this business of ours, then we will be free from your oath, which you made us swear. Then she said, according to your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed and she bound the scarlet cord in the window. So they departed and went to the mountain and stayed there three days until the pursuers returned. So obviously they went out for three days looking for them. They couldn't find them, so they left. They went back to Jericho, uh, and then they, um, they left. So the two men returned, descending from the mountain, and crossed over, and they came to Joshua the son of Nun, and told him all that had befallen them. There weren't any military pictures. There weren't, oh, they got, you know, 100,000 guys over here and 20,000 guys over here, so this is a weak spot. They didn't even care. They went to the harlot's house. She hid them. She sent them up to the mountains. They stayed there three days. They came back, and they told him, what did they tell them? They told them of this woman who saved them. And that we have, to have, we have to look for this scarlet cord in a rope, and those are to be saved. And they came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and told him all that had befallen them. And they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord has delivered all the land into our hands, for indeed all, now remember that word all here in the Hebrew is the same word all in the Greek, it means what? All. Right. The inhabitants of the country are faint-hearted because of us. Boy, that had to be so uplifting for Joshua, right? This is the guy that we know was afraid. Be strong and of good courage. I am with you all. Don't be afraid. It's okay. Joshua sends these two guys out. Are they going to be killed? What's taking them so long? Hey, go over and scout the land, especially Jericho. Where are they? When are they coming home? Did I send them to their death? What did I do? He had to be sitting and waiting. He had to be so excited for them to come back. And when they were, to hear that the people were faint-hearted and afraid. They're basically on lockdown. They don't want to come out. We're afraid. We're scared. What do we do? And so Joshua, his faith had to grow, just like the two men. And I guarantee you the word spread. And you know, it's kind of interesting because if God would have told him, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go over there, and we are going to walk around the city once a day, and we're going to blow the trumpet once. 
for six days. Uh, well, Lord, that doesn't sound like a very good plan. Remember what Pharaoh said? What kind of general is this of Israel that backs himself up against the water? Well, the kind of general that can cross the water. Oh, and by the way, while you're in the water, he's going to make the water come back so that he drowns every one of you. But see, if he'd have told him that, do you think it would have been, you know, all right, let's go. No. Okay, wait a minute. Get this straight. You said once every time for six days. Well, then what? Oh. Then we're going to do it, what? Seven times, right? And we're going to blow the trumpet. Seven times. That's our battle plan. Yeah, okay, let's go. All right. We're in good shape now. We got this battle plan down. But see, when we look at this, on this side, and we look at this and we say, come on, Joshua, man up, you know? You got God on your side. What's the big deal? But see, then we do the same thing, don't we? Oh, this obstacle, this circumstance in front of us, what am I going to do? Where do I go? What do I do? Well, God's bigger than that, right? I mean, you know, look what he did in Egypt. Look what he did at Sion and Og to then two kings. Look what he's going to do to these, to Jericho. But see, God's saying to Joshua, be strong and of good courage. And then he strengthens his faith by these two guys. Oh, and in the meantime, his whole plan was to get this woman named Rahab saved. What an awesome God. What do we got to complain about? You know, my wife told me we were having hot dogs for dinner tonight. And I was like, oh, hot dogs. So she was making chili at the same time, and while well, she wasn't looking, I was eating the chili. But <clears throat> anyway, um, so she cut up these, she bought this roast and cut up these chunks of meat into little cubes, you know. So as they were starting to cook, her, you know, her back was to me, and I was reaching in there and grabbing these chunks of meat. And my wife finally comes over to me and hands me this bag that's, you know, it's a little sandwich bag, and it's full of those chunks of meat. So she told me, we were having hot dogs, I'm thinking, no, 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 I ain't eating hot dogs. I'm eating those little chunks of meat. So, <clears throat> you know, I had this plan. And so I start out cooking it, and I overcooked my meat by like a minute and a half, and it just drove me up the wall, and I'm sitting there going, oh, what an idiot, you know. How do you overcook this? How do you overcook the meat? Well, I was making the mushrooms, and I was really trying to hurry because, to be honest with you, I didn't really want to share with anybody else. So I was hoping that she was still at the store, and you know, and because she, went, you know, she thought, well, you know, he don't want chick, he don't want uh, these hot dogs, so I'm going to go get a, a rotisserie chicken, and that's where she went. And and so here I'm trying to cook all this stuff and get all this done because I certainly didn't want to share any of this with anybody because I knew it was going to be good until I overcooked my meat. You know, and I'm sitting there going, Lord, you know, what's going on here? I can't even cook, you know, a couple pieces of meat. And, but you, you, look at, you look at what we see here in the scriptures, and, and, and God's telling Joshua to be strong and of good courage. And then he shows him, this is why. This is, I love you. I love this nation. It's okay. Those things really aren't that big of a deal. It might be in the time when your meat's overcooked, but it really isn't that big of a deal. And, we, and I know we have problems, and I know there's illnesses, and I know we struggle with families, and we struggle with things of the world, and we struggle with temptation. But you know what? God is always there. He always provides a way out. We don't have to lie we don't have to, 
you know, try to hurry up so that nobody else gets any of your food. We don't. He's got us covered. He loves you. It doesn't mean that much. Our circumstances, like the circumstances of Israel here in, in the heart of Joshua, how am I going to lead these people? Moses couldn't do it. How am I supposed to do it? And it, it's a great lesson for us to learn. Whether you're serving now and you're struggling, because if you're serving, the enemy is going to attack you. And some days are going to be a struggle. And it's going to be hard. And people are going to tell you things and you're going to take them the wrong way or you're going to take them the right way and you're going to go, wow, okay, what did I do? But God is always there. And if you sit here today and you're going, well, you know, I hear, I hear they need people to come over and, and uh, help clean the church. I mean, there's some vacuuming to do and, um, you know, mopping the floor and dusting and spraying down the chairs and vacuuming the chairs. And <coughs> it's not hard work, but many hands make the work light right? And maybe you say, ah, well, I don't want to go, because then maybe, you know, one of those people that I'm going to see in heaven for eternity are going to start talking to me, and they're going to ask me how I'm doing, and I don't know what to say, and then they're going to ask, can I pray for you? Oh, no, you can't. I'm good. I'm good. I'm really good. Really? Yeah. Well, didn't Jesus say there's none good, no, not one? So you're not good. So let them pray with you. Talk to them. You might like them. They might take you to breakfast. Yeah. It's a possibility. Hey, you might actually, you know, go help down in the children's church and them kids when they come running up to you and give you a hug and you don't know what to do. I just cry. I figure, you know, that's the best I can do. You're crying. I can cry too, you know. I, it's my party and I'll cry if I want to, you know. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Be strong and have good courage. If the Lord's prompting your heart to help, then help. Don't worry about if you're equipped, because really, to be honest with you, you're not. I mean, I'm just being honest. I'm certainly not equipped to be up here. I, who am I? I'm just a man, just a donkey. Yeah, but that donkey does have a cross on his back. You look at the back of donkeys, they all got that cross. But, you know, God uses the foolish things of this world, so the biggest fool is standing right here. So don't be afraid. Be of good courage. You might like it. Now, that would be a problem, because then you want to do it again and again. And it's like, wait a minute, I don't want to miss any weeks. Why do I have to take three weeks off? I want to be in there every week. You know, I'll tell you, a couple weeks ago, uh, Pastor Scott taught, and uh, I was back in the children's church, and I had a blast. I don't know if they liked me, but I had fun. I got to cut up puzzles, and, you know, I got to help kids spell the words correctly, although they were probably wrong anyway. But I was, was looking at the board up in front when she was writing it out. So I think I got most of them right. But I was totally blessed when I walk out of there. Totally blessed. So if the Lord's knocking at the door of your heart, get up and go do it. Isn't that why we're here? So that we can love on one another? So we could serve him by serving each other? Isn't that why we're here? Isn't that the bottom line? So what did you learn? Did you see that for one person? Didn't we see that in Acts? When God wouldn't let Paul go back to Asia 
sent him to Europe. Why? For one woman. And where was she from? Asia. She just happened to be beaching it, right, in Europe. And Paul goes all the way there to talk to her. She gets saved, right? Then they're walking down the street. Here's this girl screaming at him. Yeah. You guys are of the most high God. Paul got sick of listening to it. She was demon-possessed. So he casts out the demon. She gets saved. Well, because that happened, everybody started complaining and throw these guys in jail. What happened? They went to jail, thrown in the dungeon in the deepest depths, spread eagled out on the ground, beaten, laying in your own stuff. Worse yet, somebody else's stuff. Laying there, spread eagle. They didn't know what was going to happen to them. In the middle of the night, what are they doing? Anybody remember? They're praising the Lord. They're singing. Our God's an awesome God. Here I am laying in this stuff. But he's an awesome God. What did he do? He started tapping his foot to the beat. Hey, this is pretty good. Earthquake comes. Chains fall off. The jailer's going to kill himself. They say, no, don't. Nobody's left. We're all here. He gets saved and all his family. Is it worth it? Heck yeah. God had a plan, didn't he? A woman named Rahab, a harlot, her and all her family. He really loves you. He did the same thing for you, didn't he? He got your attention, and he told you who he was. And you sit here today. You come here tonight to hear from him. That's why we're here. You're so loved. You're so loved. And he wants you to be strong and of good courage. And he wants you to trust him. And he wants you to see these pictures. Didn't he say that in 1 Corinthians? And in Romans as well. This is for our what? Examples. Example for us. You know, why did Jesus come here? A multitude of reasons. Biggest thing is to die for our sins so that we could be restored back to him. But he also came here and showed us how do we fight temptation? The word of God. How do we know that? Because he did it, didn't he? How do we treat one another? With love and respect. Why? How do we know that? Because he did it. Now he's in heaven, waiting for us to get there. And he's preparing a place for us. And like I've said many times before, I, we won't even be able to imagine how, what this place is going to be looking like. Look at what he did in just a few days. What can he do in a couple of thousand years? Amen? Well, let's stand. And let's pray. If you need prayer, come on up here. Don't be afraid. Fear not. Be strong and of good courage. Come on up. If you don't know what to pray for, you can pray for me. You just went through 45 minutes of me. You know that I need a lot of prayer. So, Well, Father, we just so thank you for your word. We thank you that you would even bother with us. Lord, we know you love us so much. You show us on every single page as we open your word and and we talk about you and the great things that you're doing, the great things that you have done, and the great things that you're going to do. And we just know how much you love us. We thank you so much for that. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you that you made uh, yourself the sacrifice. There's no other way that we could ever have been with you. And Father, we just ask as we walk through the rest of this week and May we look for opportunities that you would open up a door that we may have an opportunity, maybe just to 
buy somebody a cup of coffee that's hurting or put our arm around somebody or just to say hello or just to say that, you know, I used to be in your same spot, but God loves you so much and he'll get you out of this. Father, I just ask that you bless each and every one of us here from the top of our heads to the bottom of our foot that, Lord, we just may be in more awe than we normally are when you bless us, Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that inhabits us, that leads us and guides us, Lord. And Father, as we meet again on Sunday, if, if you're willing, maybe here, there, or in the air, but Lord, if we meet again on Sunday, Lord, may you come and, and bless us again. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you so much for your mercy and your grace. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all his children said,